I welcome you all to the class on problem solving tools and techniques at work. Ask anyone in the workplace if problem solving and decision making are part of their day to day life at work and the answer would be yes. But how many of us have had training in problem solving? We know it's a critical element of our work and if right techniques are used, problems can be solved effectively. Let us look at the various tools to solve problems at work. We will start with brainstorming. The idea of brainstorming started when Alex Osborne, an advertisement executive, was frustrated with the poor creative output he was receiving from his employees. He realized that brainstorming in a group is much more powerful and efficient than ideating independently. To brainstorm is to use a set of specific rules and techniques to encourage and spark off new ideas around a specific area of interest. Using rules which remove inhibitions, people are able to think more freely and move into new areas of thought and create new ideas and solutions. Let us look at the rules of brainstorming. Give people time to think. The first step to brainstorming is to gather everyone in the room and start thinking. Have your team come up with ideas on their own prior to the brainstorming session. Give them time to think through and jot down their ideas independently before sharing them with the group. This allows idea to flow freely without any influence, intimidation or unintentional groupthink. The next step is talk. The best way to combat this judgment is by having everyone share their ideas. First, before giving any feedback. This is called round robin brainstorming and is helpful in silencing participants who tend to dominate the conversation and giving the quiet ones a chance to speak up. A rule of thumb in most meetings is to take notes. It's similar for a brainstorming meeting as well. However, you don't want your team to just jot down the ideas that make sense or are realistic. Don't rush into trying to uncover the best idea right away. You can narrow it down to the top ideas later. Focus on the quantity of ideas and not the quality. Provide a clear deadline for the project so your team can gauge how much time they should devote to brainstorming and when they need to start executing. This way they will focus on the idea. It can take too much time if the group is not properly controlled and is allowed to run for too long. Record all the ideas and allow everyone to add ideas on their own later. Where do we use brainstorming? It can be used for new product development, obtaining ideas for new products, and improving existing products can be used for advertising, developing ideas for advertising campaigns. It can be used for problem solving, issues, root causes, alternative solutions, impact analysis and evaluation. It can also be used for process management, which is finding ways of improving business and production processes project management, identifying client objectives, risks, roles and responsibilities, tasks and issues, and team building. It can also be used for business planning to develop and improve the product ideas. The next technique which we're going to look is cause and effect analysis 
also called as Ishikawa. The concept of Ishikawa was pioneered by Kawaru Ishikawa in 1943 who contributed to the concept of quality management in Japan. An Ishikawa diagram is a picture composed of lines and symbols designed to represent a meaningful relationship between an effect and its causes. They resemble a fish skeleton with the ribs representing the causes of an event and the final outcome appearing at the head of the skeleton. The purpose of the Ishikawa diagram is to allow management to determine which issues have to be addressed in order to gain or avoid a particular event. They are also used to investigate a bad or good effect and learn its causes and take action accordingly. When to use the diagrams? It can be used to discover the root cause of a problem when a team's thinking tends to fail to resolve problems, uncover blockages in the processes, identify where and why a process is not working. Basically, Ishikawa is used to understand the root cause of particular problem. There are various steps in the Ishikawa process. Let us look at each step. The first step is to identify the problem. First, write down the exact problem you face. Where appropriate, identify who is involved, what is the problem and when and where it occurs. Ask the W and H questions. Some people prefer to write the problems on the right hand side of the piece of paper and develop ideas in the space to the left. Use whichever approach you feel most comfortable and start with the diagram. It's important to define your problem correctly. The second step is to work out the major factors involved in the problem. Identify the factors that may be part of the problem. These may be systems, equipment, material, external forces, people involved with the problem. Brainstorm the major categories of causes of the problem. If this is difficult, use generic headings such as methods, machines, people, material, measurement, environment, etc. The same is being explained in the diagram later. Identify the possible causes. Now, for each of the factors you considered in step 2, brainstorm possible causes of the problem that may be related to the factor. Show these problem causes as shorter lines coming off the bones of the diagram. Where a cause is large or complex, then it may be best to break it down into sub-causes. Show these as lines coming off each cause line. Analyze your diagram and take action accordingly. Let us look at the fishbone diagram. It shows the causes and shows the effect. The circle will have the effect and the other side, left hand side has the causes. The causes could be due to the line which is here, this is the main line of cause and these are the various causes because of which the problem has occurred. So the causes can be put up as people, method, measurements, machines, environment, materials and the sub causes are always pointing towards the main cause. So there could be main, many various things which would be related to material. For example, people, it could be training or it could be their attitude. So which will always be pointed towards the main cause and the people would be pointing towards the uh, main skeleton of the fish. The whole diagram looks like 
the skeleton of a fish and that is the reason it is called as a fish bone diagrams. Various problems can be resolved through this particular technique. The next problem solving tool which, go, which we are going to look at is Pareto analysis which is also called as 80-20 principle. The Pareto principle which was named after economist Wilfredo Pareto specifies that 80% of the consequences come from 20% of the causes. Asserting an unequal relationship between inputs and outputs. This principle serves as a general reminder that relationship between inputs and output is not balanced. Pareto analysis is a statistical technique in problem solving or decision making which is used for the selection of a limited number of tasks that produced significant overall effect. It uses the Pareto principle which is also known as the 80-20 rule. The idea that by doing 20% of the work you can generate 80% of the benefit of doing the entire job. It is an important quality improvement tool and is applicable to problem identification and measurement of progress. The Pareto principle can be applied in a wide range of areas such as manufacturing, management and human resources. Let us look at some examples to understand the principle. For instance, the efforts of 20% of a corporation's staff could drive 80% of the firm's profit. Another example could be, in terms of personal time or time management, 80% of your work related output could come from 20% of your time at work. The Pareto principle can be applied especially for those businesses that are client service based. It can be adopted by a variety of coaching and customer relationship management software programs.